Today, we are going to talk about five critical editing mistakes. If not done right, a few of these mistakes can ruin your chance to win photo awards. And even worse, some of them could actually ruin your whole photography career. My name is Tin Man Lee. I am a full-time wildlife photographer. I have been a judge for some photo contests, including Nature Photographer of the Year and Bird Photographer of the Year. Let's begin. Sometimes some of my students would send me photos uh, on the social media and uh, tell me what I think about it. There seems to be a trend that I've seen quite a few photographers are doing that. But before I go into that, I want to share with you what happened two years ago. I was in Maasai Mara, Kenya on an Africa safari. And the night before, it gets really cold. When we drove out, the whole savannah was covered with a heavy fog and the visibility was really low and it was pre-dawn, so it was really dark. We hoped to find something, <laughs> anything it would be good. Our driver was driving and I remember there is a small hill and it just go up like this, it, it almost like this Disney ride, those roller coaster that just keep driving up higher and higher. Just when we reach the apex and then the, when the vehicle got leveled up, boom, <laughs> uh, there's a male lion just right on the side of the road looking at us. And I will never forget that scene because it was still in heavy fog, but it was in backlit, so the, the sun was behind the lion. And because of that light, like penetrating the fog, it creates like this fairy tale. The rim light was on the fur of the lion. And we were like, oh my God, I couldn't even believe it. And then we hold the camera and took some photos. And, uh, and let me show you that photo. Okay, so that's the photo. Okay, if you can see it, right here. It's uh, amazing and I shouldn't say that for my own photo. The, the fog and all this, it, it was just mind-blowing to me because you have to have all these perfect components, right? Uh, seeing a lion right at the time when the sun just come up, shining through the fog and then creating all this light and this mystery. Over the last 15 years of doing photography, that was really the first time that I was able to have such an encounter, such a sighting in this kind of light and condition. So having said that, when I got back to reality, when my students sent me some of the photos, I look at their photos and every single one of them have this kind of light condition. I, I was a little bit speechless because it told me that many years, how could these photographers be so good? And a lot of them, I have not seen their work before. It's, it's like quite a lot of new, newer photographers. And, and then uh, slowly it dawned on me that these photos are photoshopped. I realized that what they did was they started with a typical photo, just normal lighting, maybe just like an overcast day. What they did was they combined two things. One is called the Alton effect, which make the scene kind of misty, kind of foggy. And then they added a fake light source on like maybe the left side or the right side of the image. So all of a sudden their photo um, was like they have encountered uh, this same scene uh, I saw in Africa, backlit with the fog. It got me thinking when they were taking the photos, there were actually no fog, no backlit. So in a way, what they are doing is very much like replacing the whole background with something else. Of course, they have freedom to do anything, but a few years ago, I saw a few photos of domestic dogs, pet photography. The photographer, what they did was they have these dogs jumping towards the camera. They create like a blur of the background completely and then created this fake light source in the back as if this is like a misty backlit scene. And these photos went viral. And it is not surprising why it went viral because if you Remember my reaction in Maasai Mara when I saw this moment the first time in 15 years. It triggers human emotion when people see this kind of once-a-lifetime lighting. Right now, photographers can easily create that kind of uh, background in Photoshop. Let, let me just show you here. Let's go back into this Photoshop right here. I've already prepared this photo. So this photo is a bald eagle on a driftwood that I took in 
Alaska a few years ago, and the background was actually some distant mountains. Typical photo, right? But what people have been doing is they just create something like that. They just brighten this part and then create some blur in the background. When you look at this photo, does it remind you of something like this, right? So naturally, people react much stronger when they see these kind of photos. But it, it is not real though. It didn't really happen. This method attracted a lot of newer photographers to try that because it instantly allows them to get a lot more lights. And in the social media age, everything is about the light. <laughs> that created a, a problem because a photo contest, if the judges see these kind of photos when they compare to the raw, this is creating a completely new light source. <laughs> so it's not going to fly. The, the photo is going to be disqualified. There is another thing that I really want to point out which is like how do you draw the line between adding a light source and adding this mist versus doing very minimal editing. I've actually seen quite a lot of photographers say this is self-expression, this is art, I can do whatever I want, which is, I, of course, this is totally okay. There is uh, one thing though, when a viewer sees a photo of a bird or a wildlife, one of the things that makes it so special is because people assume that the photographers have spent a lot of the time in the field to wait for that special moment with that perfect light, perfect background, and perfect encounter. And that's why they fall in love with nature photography. If you tell the viewers that, oh, actually, I completely changed the background. If, if a kid sees this and then they got inspired, and then when you tell them this is all fake, it's gonna ruin it, ruin that experience. And also, I think when you decide to become a bird and wildlife photographer, it is like a, at least to me, it's like a conviction. Right now, birds, wildlife, the habitat are really disappearing because of human a lot of the time. When we can take photos that tells a story that is so powerful, I hope that we don't change the background um, so that it really is something that is real. I can share with you a few things that people have been doing that I've seen. Let me just go back into this photo right here. The second thing photographers that I see actually in when, I, when we're judging photo contests is, so this is the original, right? So what they would do is they would actually darken the scene like this. It's actually quite easy to do these days because you can select the subject and then just darken the background and it will be a lot more natural than what I'm doing here. I'm just doing it quickly. Photographers, a lot of the people that I admire, they spend years and their whole career to hope that they can have an encounter when the animals is in some of this dark background or like this kind of background. They spend a whole life on that. That is why photography is so challenging, yet so much rewarding for them. It's because most of the time, the background, the surrounding is so messy, so difficult to handle. But then there's always this moment when like a miracle happens with the hard work, with the patience and everything. And then it all comes together with that perfect photo. And now all of a sudden, when somebody is replacing it with this kind of things, it's almost like you're going to a marathon, but you call a cab and it dropped you off near the destination. Then you, you just lose um, the whole meaning. For example, this is a photo I took in Masai Mara in Kenya, but it is so easy to change it to something like that. Just add a thick light source, blur some of the background. And these kind of photos probably will receive 10 times more lights than a photo like that. Because this is a once a lifetime kind of lighting that I only see in with the lion. But when you change it, it is so easy. It's so tempting for photographers to do that because who doesn't like a few more lights, validation and stuff is good. But that is lying to the viewers. If you just crop an animal out and then add this fake background, then it's just illustration. Then it is no longer bird and wildlife photography. And I, over these last few years, I've known a lot of photographers, right? They risk their life trying to be genuine in their photography, 
to fight against illegal poaching of the animals, really showing the disappearing habitat and those. And I think it will do a disservice to those people who are working really hard to tell the truth about the animals and birds. And then suddenly there's this huge influx of uh, photos with uh, all this kind of fake background. It is like if you have ever been in a relationship for a long time, you dedicated all your care, all your love, everything, all your trust into something. Until one day you realize that your significant others were, were cheating the whole time. Imagine if there is one day that you went on a epic trip, right? You spent lots of time hiking, wading, risking your life on all this tough environment. And finally something happened. The encounter, perfect background, perfect light, and everything like that comes together. And boom, you take a photo finally, and then you share it online. However, five years ago, you posted a photo with this thick light source and darkening of uh, background and stuff like that. And people find it out. Once people knew that you were doing something like that, they would just assume that all the rest of your photos were using this same method. So all the hard work you, you put in this new photo will not be trusted. Right now, this is social media too. So that's why people can always uh, find that out. For example, you can see that there is some background that has high contrast, dark and bright and those, and th that could be distracting. Then what they do is they would just choose the, the subject and then you do an invert. And now you choose the, it becomes the background. And then all you do is just, just to brighten this. And, and then you click and then you go back in here and then you just also brighten the line just a little bit like that. And then suddenly you become like a picture that doesn't have any distraction, look like a, a high key photo. And I've seen quite a lot of photographers doing that too. I totally understand why people are doing it because when people have spent five years, 10 years waiting for those moments to happen in nature, but you can just easily spend two seconds to change that. And you don't need to spend that much time in the field and you can get the same kind of reaction from the viewers is very tempting. But at the end, I think the consequence and the backfire can be can be pretty bad. This is a pretty big problem right now, especially with the social media thing. There is a big reason why like this black background would be so powerful because for like the oil painting by Leonardo da Vinci recently sold for 450 million Salvador Mundi, the photo with the dark background. So like these kind of backgrounds is what exactly why photographers are spending so much time, so much effort to look for in nature because they can really evoke emotion. About 10 years ago, I went to Denali National Park and I was very fortunate to have an encounter of a dog sheep with a rainbow background. And I remember my girlfriend asked me one day, say, that photo was so nice. You did add the rainbow in the photo, right? <laughs> and she's no longer my girlfriend, but it's not because of that reason though. I am not that bad. Number three is something that I see quite a lot of photographers making. When you take a photo, some of the experts will, will teach you that you don't want the brightest part to be so bright. So what you do is you lower the highlight and then you want to bring out more details in the shadowy area for the dark areas because otherwise it will be so dark that people couldn't see. So you open up the shadow in the slider, right? Let me just show you here. So what you do is once you reduce the highlights, lower the bright area, brighten the, the dark area, the photo will become like this. So that reminds me of those old, old days with these HDR images. And after you see a lot of those, you just say, ah, I don't want to see it. Why does it look so bad? And why does it causes the judges to puke? It's because of the dynamic range becomes so low. Let me show you here. If you go back into the original photo and if you look at the histogram right here, that the histogram is like this bell shape. This is a nice spread of the, the histogram right here. But if you go to this image right here, and if you go to the histogram, that this is a lot narrower. I have seen judges who would actually open the image and look at the histogram, especially for black and white photos. Let me see if I can have another example right here. Yes, I do. So for example, some photographers would 
do this. So they go into this image and then they would lower the highlights uh, because it's too bright, opening the shadow because I want to see all the details in the cave. And then once you do that, it's like, ah, it, so that has this kind of, how, how do I say it? It's like this, it's not clean anymore. It's so, so a lot of, lots of dirt and, and stuff. It's just mad messy. So this is not good. So make sure that you have still have high contrast. Number four is about cropping. A lot of the photographers, including me in the beginning, is said, oh, okay, I can just take some photos and then crop a lot tighter. Until I met Charles Glasser, one of my mentors, and he's a Canon explorer of light. And I remember one time he said, I spent so much money for all the pixels in the camera. So why would I want to crop it away with all the details and stuff? It makes a lot of sense. And some people say, that's why I bought these cameras, because that's so that I can crop. But for me, photography is like a passion in a game and I want to master my crafts to perfect it and one of the aspects that I want to do is to be able to get almost like a uh, perfect photo in camera with minimum cropping. That's just a challenge for me and it is so much more fun. Henry Cartier Brasson is a legendary photographer so I always stress about how to get everything perfect in frame so I see it as my inspiration. Funny enough, two of my photos, one of them won the grand prize of Nature's Best Photography, Winnan Smith Rice International. The other one won the wildlife category of also Nature's Best Photography and both of them were photos that was near full frame so very minimum crop like maybe like less than five percent crop and somehow they won the category and the grand prizes so i don't know if there's a coincidence but that's what i want to share with you so number five is something a little bit boring but it's so important so have you ever seen some photos that people shared in magazines or in books and those that, you know, the photos looks good, the, the moments, the encounter, the sharpness, but then it seems like the whole photo has like this wash of green cast or whatever blue and green cast. Whenever I see those, and I still see it a lot in different websites, I realize the photographer has messed up the color space. So what do you mean when you take photos and you put it into the editing software, you can set the color space. So there are usually the three popular ones. One is called the sRGB, one is called Adobe RGB 1990A, and then one is called Profoto RGB or something. So these three color spaces, they are like... So what really is color space? I'm not going to go deep into it. Not that I really know. <laughs> but what it means is that the color tonality or different colors and for example red color right they have like dark red and bright red and all this tone pro photo and adobe rgb has the biggest range and then srgb has the smallest range the smaller range of colors is compatible with most of the viewing devices such as the iphone the mac the, the most of the monitors so why do people need pro photo and adobe rgb is for printing some of the landscape photographers, especially when the photos has all kinds of colors, all kinds of dynamic range, they want to maximize it. And some of the professional printers can handle more color of that. However, when you are dealing with submitting the photo contest, if you save your photo in a, a color space such as Adobe RGB, which is much bigger, and then when the judge or the, the contest is asking you for something like an sRGB because they are viewing in the monitor. So all these extra colors, the bigger color gamut in Adobe RGB and Profoto, the mapping will cause a problem. And sometimes the mapping will be completely messed up and that's why it will cause this green cast and a blue cast of the photo. And when a judge, when they see it, they would think that you mess up all the color of the photos and it would be disqualified. It actually happened to me one year when I was sending some photos for printing and all of them were okay except one. And then I, I saw the print and I said, ah, I forgot to, to convert it to the color space. So it's actually quite easy to fix it. Let me just share with you again. If you go into here, what you do is you go into edit, convert to profile. 
and then you just select sRGB and that is it Ex unless some of the photo contests would ask you to submit it with a uh, Adobe RGB then you just convert it to Adobe RGB you can do it in Lightroom as well but just make sure to look at the menu look at the instructions or go to YouTube and look for like how do I convert to uh, color space make sure you don't miss those finally I just want to share with you one thing. Some of my students ask me, Hey Tin Man, can you teach us how do we express our arts? Let's do self-expression, right? That's like the ultimate thing for photography, right? How do you express your true authentic self to it? And the funny thing was that you don't need to do that because really how you take your photos, you already show who you are. So for example, some people may do unethical things to capture some of those photos, right? If you enjoy this video, you should also check out another video, which I talk about metering and what, how to find the perfect settings. Because even though you know how to do editing, but if the photos that you took in the field is are not maximizing the opportunity, then it will still create a lot of difficulties for editing. So definitely check it out and I'll see you next time.